Uh, is it working? Okay, so, um, uh, so I want to state four problems that are pretty precise, although my presentation may not be very precise. We may have to discuss it more. Uh, and uh, so one thing, uh, So, so, is that okay? <laughs> so, uh, so w w this meeting is using a lot the language of uh, field theories, and I wanted to concentrate on two-dimensional field theories. And uh, there's always been this uh, mixing of uh, language that often confused me and puzzled me. Uh, and I'll, so I'm going to start by making a comment about that. So, uh, so two-dimensional field theories so I'm concentrating on, on those. Well, they can, they can be caricatured. This talk is going to be like a caricature of a math talk anyway, so <laughs> caricatures by um, interactions uh, I'll just put of here, strings. You know, because if you have a 2D field theory, the, uh, even in its, ex in its extended form, we have these, uh, the boundary is either circles or arcs, and then we have these surfaces, and you're supposed to describe algebraic structures, functors, and so on, on surfaces whose boundary are these uh, uh, circles and arcs. So you can think of the, uh, you know, sort of thinking of, think of the surfaces being, uh, the, sur the uh, circles and arcs being swept out through the surface. And, and as they go through the surface, they, they interact and they come out the other end. So that's the caricature I want to think of. And so I remember uh, 15 years ago going to lectures and physicists talking about string theory. So they draw this picture, you know, like um, this is A. Uh, you have a string. So you imagine it's moving around in some space or the way in this language of 2D field theory, you know, this vector space or, uh, uh, or this thing that you attach to the circle, an element in that thing is, can be thought of as describing a state of the circle or whatever you attach. So, the, so it's, it's in some state, but we can think of it as its state as being just a geometric position in some manifold and then it's sort of maybe moving in time according to some unknown evolution and maybe we have a couple of them and uh, they get kind of uh, close together and then they interact and, and you sort of have an action like that. The two strings come together and they touch and they interact. And you can also have kind of the reverse thing, I'm going to call that B of uh, of a string like that, and it touches itself, and then uh, I don't know why I have to look at my notes for this, and then it <laughs> breaks into two. So these are two interactions, and uh, and then we can have C. Well, strings can be, these are closed strings. You can have non-closed strings. So I'm going to say non-closed strings, and then I might change to open strings, but non-closed strings. So non-closed strings are just like that. And, and you know, nice one is you can have a couple of them, and they touch at the endpoints, and then they somehow come together. And then you have an analog. Uh, kind of a dual analog of that, which is you can have a string that 
for some reason it breaks apart and and then but there are, there are many more for example you can have you can mix these so you can have like Uh, a non-closed string interacting with an open string so it can go to like that or so let, let's call that E and then F you can have sort of um, this, is a, this is a good one here uh, you can have a string like that that starts to touch itself and then gives birth to, so you have a non-closed string giving birth to a closed string and another non-closed string. And there, you know, and many more. Okay, so I want to make some comments about some of these in turn. So for example, let's talk about a, because I've got the names I want to write up here. So this, some comments about A. So, first of all, this one is very homogeneous. Uh, you know, it looks the same. No matter where this interaction took place, it's, there's no boundary or anything. So that's a key thing is that um, Oh, I forgot to, yeah, I forgot to say, there was, I have something way up here before I get started. So, uh, there's a, I, I was going to do this at the end, but I decided I was, should get, get it out of the way right away. Yeah? Can you push the board up so I can see the pictures all the time? Okay, sorry. So this is a cute thing. H can be completed to uh, homotopic or homologous or holomorphic. And one can imagine discussions of field theories where these, these words are, are in the discussion are of primary importance. So like if you were doing chain complexes and so on, you'd be doing homology, you could be doing more things with infinity categories and so it would be kind of maybe like homotopy, but then you can imagine some setting in which you can do more holomorphic type constructions, which is more in the spirit of um, teichner stoltz program, although it seems to be deforming a little bit today with Pavlov's talk into the infinity world a little bit, but uh, and then I'm not going to talk any more about this except to say that there's, uh, we're going to, the strings and the, we saw the loop space in the last talk. Uh, in algebraic geometry, there's, there's a, a version of uh, talking about some states of closed strings in a holomorphic context. And anyway, it's a structure that goes under the name factorization algebra. Drinfeld and Balenson talk about it in dimension two, and I think Kevin's work is extending it to higher dimensions. So, uh, in a sense, it's this, it's, you could imagine it uh, being parallel to these things, but I'm really going to be thinking more in these two contexts. In fact, more in this one, actually. Okay, but, so that being said, so. Uh, so the free loop space has a definition in algebraic geometry over curves, and uh, one can imagine doing things there. You know, you know, get things like vertex operator algebras and stuff like that. But I don't. I don't. I'm going to go back. To, I want to sort of uh, do it in the in the algebraic topology way. So yeah. So let me make some comments on A. So I'm going to pull this down. Okay, for a minute. I'll open it up again and talk about 
B and C and D, okay? The comments in A, so the first thing is, that I'll call this is that um, it has no boundary. See, there's no boundary. This is no boundary, no boundary. The interaction has no boundary. And this is kind of an algebra. Two things combined to give something, that's an algebra. And uh, the algebra is, it, it, it's, it's not associative algebra, it satisfies Jacobi. This operation is related really to a Lie algebra structure. Uh, you might think, how could it satisfy Jacobi? Because Jacobi is like a three term sum equals zero. This is sort of a geometric thing. How can it give zero? Three geometric pieces giving zero. Well, the point is that when you have to interact three strings to describe Jacobi. One and two interact, right? So one and two combine to give the combined thing. And then you take a third string and let it interact. The third string could interact with this part or with this part. So that one term in Jacobi breaks up into two terms. And then you cyclically permute, so you get six terms and they cancel in pairs. So you should draw those pictures and try to see why that might be true And once you make this cartoon into something concrete. Okay. Uh, and so one gets the Lie algebra and it's part of uh, this structure is not literally part of what uh, uh, Daniel stated last time of Lurie Searns because he didn't quite have the circle action formulated, but you can formulate it and get an equivariant operation out of what, what you were describing from Lurie's theorem. And then that, this would be the equivariant pair of pants uh, operation. And it's a Lie algebra. And by the very nature of Lurie's theorem, uh, say if, if these strings are moving in a manifold, so anyway, so uh, yeah, let me give a little kind of de definition of, so string topology is what I mean by, you know, imagine all conceivable operations like this where you interpret them inside an ambient manifold and you interpret the states as being some kind of families of strings and you perform various classical intersection procedures to make these operations make sense. So string topology means these caricature operations interpreted in algebraic topology. Means the, these, means these pictures interpreted via algebraic topology. <coughs> totally illegible, sorry. Now, uh, I, I, there's a couple of uh, general things I forgot to say here. Yeah, so, it, well, in this F here, notice that uh, if you have some non-closed string theory, closed strings appear. They're sort of born out of the non-closed string theory. If you have these operation, then you're going to get closed strings coming. It's a co-module. Co what? F is a co-module string. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, 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 you can think of it as a, that's, this is a co, you know, this is like a module structure and this is a co-module structure, right. Yeah, the Lie algebra, this Lie algebra is acting. Yeah, this, well, let, you're getting ahead of things, getting ahead. Let's stick to this, this first one. So it satisfies Jacobi, and if we go into manifold, it's according to Lurie's presentation, in fact, this, was, this special case was proven before, but this is a homotopy invariant of the ambient manifolds. So if you have two manifolds that are homotopy equivalent as manifolds of boundary or as closed manifolds, then that homotopy equivalence induces an isomorphism between these Lie algebras. So I haven't said where they're defined, but it's a homotopy invariant. Now, uh, that's uh, actually, this is uh, uh, not, this is good news in, in low dimensions. This is still, this is powerful in 2D and 3D because 
manifolds and things about them. Most of the things about two manifolds, or essentially everything, is described by homotopy invariant concepts. And in 3D, most everything is described by homotopy invariant concepts. So, for example, uh, uh, Morvichas and Fabiana Krongold showed that with this Lie algebra structure, you can, you can solve the disjunction problem. Suppose you have a surface and you have two complicated curves on it, closed curves on it, and you want to know whether you can uh, move them up to isotopy to make them disjoint, then it's true if and only if the Lie bracket of the powers of each curve with powers of the other curve are zero. If you can make them disjoint, then they don't, they, they're not interacting. Yeah, so on a surface, you don't have to imagine this happening dynamically. On a surface, curves automatically are interacting or not because they're already transversely intersecting. And so this is, this is a, a non-trivial theorem. Uh, and then in, in 3D, you can use the structure of this Lie algebra to, this is uh, these two, uh, the, the form of the geometrization. So we have this geometrization theorem now that three manifolds have this nice decomposition into p certain kinds of pieces, geometric, and the form of that decomposition, uh, whether how many connected sums and whether you have hyperbolic, and then when you take the primes and you break them into their hyperbolic pieces and cipher fibered pieces, you can read that off from the structure of this Lie algebra. So these are two applications of this uh, uh, aspect of, of uh, string interactions in topology, which are ho homotopy invariant. Okay, so that's comments about A. Right, now let me discuss B. Now th this, this is, two of the problems are about what's happening now. Uh, B has a boundary. <coughs> because you can imagine uh, a very tiny interaction with itself and then a tiny little circle comes off and something like that. And then you can sort of move it and pull it out and then it has no interaction with itself. So you're sort of moving along and then the thing intersects with itself and it, it's interacting, interacting, and then, but one piece gets smaller and smaller and then you pull it out and it disappears. So this is kind of a boundary in the middle of the process. So. Again, this is a caricature. You don't know what I mean, but see, this, this sort of thing doesn't happen here because there's no boundary anywhere. It's homogeneous. Something, it's because the, see here, the configuration, if you sort of start writing down what you want to do, you want to look for points where this intersects with that. This is, this pair of points is one point on a torus, which is a Cartesian product. A torus is a cycle. But where these two points intersect, these are like two points on a circle. If they're distinct, that's a non-compact subset and it has a boundary. So this interaction is labeled by a non-compact set and it has a, you have to deal with the boundary term. The boundary term is where the two points come together which create this boundary here. This has a boundary and this, we'll call this an anomaly. So, in fact, you can, um, okay, so you, um, but anyway, if we just, just remember it has a boundary, but this, this operation, so, it, uh, so B has a boundary that you have to deal with if you want to get construction variant things out of it. But anyway, it, it satisfies a, a co-Jacobi identity, it's sort of just dual to the other thing. And uh, and then the t 
two operations together, well, okay, so you, you, it satisfies code to code because it has a boundary. So there's a way to get rid of the boundary, and that's to take the loop space, the free loop space where this thing is defined, and mod out by the small loops. Now, I'm, uh, and then, and then you, you sort of algebraically re you repress the boundary, and then it becomes well defined, and then it defines, defined on the homology of the relative, the loop space modulo the fixed points of the circle action, and then it satisfies Jacobi. And then, in fact, you can, uh, the two operations, the Jacobi and the Jacobi operations, interact nicely, and they satisfy this five term identity due to Drinfeld called Lie by algebra. And they also intersect, interact uh, to satisfy another in identity called the involutive identity. And these four identities uh, correspond to studying uh, the four surfaces of Euler characteristic minus two. So I got four identities, Co Jacobi, Co-Jacobi, Drinfeld, and then volutive identity. So that each one of these you sort of, and, and the idea is you, uh, this one, this point I'm making now is not relevant, but uh, you, when you deal with the anomaly by collapsing and look at the moduli space that's organizing the field theory, then you have to add pieces at infinity you can't, well actually you don't have to, you can add pieces at infinity and then when you study the uh, boundary of that top chain you get these, in each of these, for these, each of these three moduli spaces, you get these three identities Kojikobi, Drinfeld, and the involutive identity. Okay, but well, anyway, and then, uh, so problem one can be stated now uh, Uh, I'll say it in a funny way. Is this combined structure not a homotopy invariant? <laughs> and somebody may have proved it is. I don't know. I'm not totally current on every version I'm not, of the new, all the new theories that are being developed. So the combined structure, the name of it is you know, kind of a fancy structure. It's an involutive Lie by algebra. So if you just force A and B to be defined, A is already cooperating and defined, make B be well defined. And, and I must say that for surfaces without the involutive, this was done in the 80s by uh, Goldman and Turayev. And we, we uh, extended it to to all manifolds, closed or not, all orientable manifolds. And then I must say that this analysis here of, of what I was referring to here is uh, a lot of this is described rather informally, although this particular piece of it is described sort of carefully in here. And then a, a much more of the further structure is described carefully in here and uh, in, in, in the work that's going on, joint work that's going on here, they're trying to describe the, there's, there's some natural compactification of the open moduli space which is germane to this problem. I'll, I'll come back to that a little later. Uh, well, well, actually, I, I'll, I'll do it now. This is, I'll call this problem two. So describe the um, uh, relevant uh, compactification of, of the, the moduli space that <coughs> describes these uh, string, I'll, I'll call them 
universal, because I want to, just to give them a name, these are universal string interactions. So this, this means you're just imagining all possible permutations and combinations of all these pictures <laughs> like this. And, and whenever there's a boundary you, you, there's, there's, or an anomaly, you have to uh, get it into algebraic topology. You'd like to uh, hide as much of the boundary as you can. The more boundary you hide, the more invariance you will have. If you don't hide the boundary, it's contractible and uh, you don't have any invariance at all. So, and, and somehow the geometric structure is, that's germane is usually used to help you hide the boundary. So you get invariance of that geometric structure. So the pure homotopy theory does not allow you, as far as I can see, to hide the boundary. Dennis? Yeah. What do you mean by hide the boundary? Well, it's like, suppose I have a, a manifold with boundary and I happen to know that the boundary is actually like a tubular neighborhood of something lower dimensional and I can, I can make that tube smaller and smaller, I can kill the boundary. So I get a cycle. So you use something to get rid of the boundary. Fill it in, fill in the boundary. Algebraic topology means, <laughs> uh, uh, means the idea of a cycle for me. So you need a cycle. So, uh, or it's a bunch of chains whose boundary you understand. Okay. Okay, that's A and maybe a little bit of B. This problem, well, I'm, problem two is this is, let's say, uh, the way they're working on it and so on. I think this, I'm stating it now, let's say, for the closed strings. So you could, you know, you can imagine doing it also for the open string, non-closed strings, but, okay. All right, now, okay, so we've done, discussed A and B, problem one, problem two, page one done. Okay, now let's go to C. Okay, so let's comment about C now. Well, well, First of all, I should say that C I didn't say enough before, but Amen. it's very natural to think of there's some. Uh, may, may I ask one question? Yeah, just let me just write this sentence here. And it's natural to think of these non closed strings as running between some boundary conditions. And so I, I was sort of tacitly assuming that, that there's some kind of boundary conditions. Okay. Okay, then it's just Word relevant. I mean, do you think that this problem is about good? what? Yes, it's word relevant. Do what? It is word relevant. relevant. Describe, describe the relevant compactification. So, I mean, oh, the word relevant. So, do you think there is a definite answer to this? Oh, yeah, there's a definite answer. I, I know what it is. I mean, ah. I mean, I mean. <laughs> I once heard Vogan make this sentence. I was so impressed by it. He said, I know how to make this computation, but I haven't done it yet. <laughs> <laughs> So I can say that. I know what it is. And in fact, it appears very naturally in string topology, and it's the same one that appears, I, that was later in the talk, in contact topology. It's the same compactification. And, and I'll tell you what it is. It's uh, when you have a surface, Riemann surface with boundary, I mean, I'll tell you what an abstract, the definition. You've got input boundaries and output boundaries. There's a harmonic function with values in 0, 1, which is 0 here and 1 here. Now I want to take limits of this object where the Riemann surfaces say converging in the usual sense of converging as Riemann surfaces, like in hyperbolic geometry or the mumper compactification or hyperbolic geometry, and the harmonic function is converging too. So for example, then you can do things like pinch off like that. That's okay. And you can pinch off like this. But you can't pinch off both curves at one level. Because the harmonic function would the harmonic function pushes these strings through, keeping the total length constant in this geometry. And so it's that compactification. 
That's the one that you can intuitively see acts in string topology. So it's a partial Deline Mumford kind of temporal gauge kind of compactification. Okay, so C is, uh, well, C is this thing that we all know and love. It's uh, like an associative algebra. So, so first of all, C, it has no boundary. No, uh, it's like no new boundary or extra boundary. It has its own boundary, which boundary conditions, but there's no new boundary in this operation. In fact, some boundary is removed. And it's, and it, instead of being a Lie algebra, like this was a Lie algebra, this is the analog. So A is the closed string analog of C. This is an associative algebra. Or, you know, if you get technical, sometimes you have to do an infinity version of that. But, uh, and actually, uh, it's more like a category, too, because, well, I mean, it depends. It's, it's an, I'll just call it an associative algebra. We think, so the basic idea of the structure is an associative algebra. So is this like the previous talk where everything you say is derived? Yeah. Yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, there's been many uh, papers written, uh, and, and, and also this, and now C leads you to the, I think this is originally Graham Siegel's should have, did I write his name first? Should have written his name first. Graham Siegel had this idea that long ago that uh, non-closed strings should be thought of as morphisms in a category. Probably because he's a topologist and a path is a morphism in a category. And so this leads to categorical uh, language, al associative algebras, special case of linear category categorical language, and then, uh, and then all of these people have done many things about this category. In particular, Kevin uh, explained, uh, the first person I heard this from, uh, uh, how when you have the, the algebra, if you have the, just these non-closed strings, and how, where does this operation come, in, come from? So he has, ah, if you take some kind of Hochschild construction of this associative algebra, then you construct the closed strings. So Kevin's idea is that you take this associative algebra and form some kind of Hochschild construction. And, and if, it's like if, if you do the equivariant, the, we use the con B model and so on, the B operator and do equivariant, there's a Lie algebra there. And so A comes in directly out of C by Hochschild's construction, thanks to Kevin. Did you think of that yourself, or are you trying to understand somebody else? I learned a lot from Kontsevich. Huh? I learned a lot from Kontsevich, actually. Okay. All right. And I can understand you. <laughs> uh, I have a question. All right. So, and then... Uh, I, have a, I have a question. Yes. The co-bracket is the one we have to mod out by the... Yeah, the co-bracket has the anomaly. Right. So does, that doesn't, does that have any interpretation in terms of this, I guess, Costello? Well, no. As far as I know, this is work to be done. Yeah, this is work to be done. I think that... Well, I think that things along the line you were doing are understood very well. We haven't really gotten to there. And, uh, but, I mean, so, well, this is... Let's see. Let's say I don't know. I, I have some things I could say, but they're just, they're not, I don't master it. Uh, right, so, so from this associative algebra point of view, this thing is implicit in some cons algebraic constructions, or at least I think the way Kevin says it is that the category of, uh, of uh, if you take the non-closed strings and you add a consistent closed string theory, then that forms a category and it has an initial object which is given by the Hochschild theory, something like that, right? So the, the Hochschild construction is the universal one consistent with the closed strings, but there could be some collapsing of it, you know. 
Uh, yeah, I see I have another list of names here. Larry Kansevich, Telemann, and Costello. This is <laughs> it's sort of related to your question. I meant to say is that um, there's this idea of 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 uh, there's there's a solved problem, which is the like problem. Problem two prime has been solved, where if you you put yourself in, in the appropriate setting uh, and you assume that the equivariance can be uh, of the circle action can be deformed to the identity, then there's a bunch of works showing that the uh, the theory extends to the full compactification, the delene mumford compactification. So that, that is a well understood uh, aspect of the theory, which kind of relates to your question, but I forget. Okay. Okay, now, uh, this uh, D, and then we have, okay, so we have this, and then this leads to Hochschild. Uh, etc. Et, et so, okay, but now let's discuss D. Actually, I've always wondered about this. Um, you see, this is like category. Is you know, this leads you to the idea of category, and this is some kind of co-category. Do you guys talk about co-categories? That's where you have a morphism and you factor it into into morphisms and somehow organize that. That's exactly what this is doing. So D is some kind of co-algebra, just like this is a Lie algebra and this is a co-Lie algebra. This is some kind of co, so let's discuss D. And it's, there's a, there's a co-category set of things here. Uh, maybe, you know, sometimes you don't have to say the co-word if you have some duality, because then you could just use the duality to convert an algebra into a co-algebra. So maybe that's why you haven't seen it. You've got some duality, but um, so uh, so D is co-associative. It's it's like a co-algebra again. It's co-associative. So like this was Lie algebra. This is Lie co-algebra. This is associative algebra and associative co-algebra. But it has boundary. Because uh, this, whatever made this string cut, it could be you know your surface was like this, and you know, the string when it hit here it got cut, and this cut may uh, happen very near the boundary. So, so there's some there's some uh, complicated special circumstance when the cut happens too near the boundary and in the limit you have the boundary so it creates a boundary term and this one I've been puzzling about it for years since 98 in fact because it's very interesting uh, in in another setting in fact it's a very simple setting where you think of um, the base loop space as being a closed string where the two endpoints agree so you can think of the free loop space, the non-equivalent free loop space, as a, as a non-open, a non-closed string, but where the boundary condition is that they agree. Because you can think of, the, put the boundary condition anyway, you have a bunch of closed strings, the endpoints are points in a Cartesian product. You can ask that that point be on some submanifold. So if you ask it be on the diagonal of the square, then, then you get that. So you really should think of the non-equivalent free loop space as being a part of closed string theory. Ah. Non-closed string theory, i.e. open string theory. I'm, I'm trying to say non-closed because they non-closed. So uh, and, and 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 this operation just in that case is quite interesting. Uh, but then it would correspond to a, a free loop that intersects the base the mark point again at a point very near itself. 
And this, this has nice algebraic properties. It's what's called these two structures formed an infinitesimal bialgebra, but there's this anomaly. You can never get rid of it. You can't do the trick of uh, modding out by short things because that's the unit. The unit is the sum of constant loops in this associative algebra. So if you mod it out by the unit, you kill everything. Somehow for a Lie algebra in the equivariant theory, you can, kill, you can mod out by the constant loops and you don't kill everything. So you can't, you have to deal with it. So after a long interlude, the anomaly of D has been treated, but it calls for a whole new change of uh, perspective. And uh, where did I write Somnath's name? Where's his name? Where's, where's Somnath? Okay. There we go. Okay, so, so these are, this, this is an idea, and I, oh, I should write one more name. Uh, this is a graduate PhD of Michael Sullivan. He's at MIT this year. So after a long interlude, the anomaly of D has been treated using transversal boundary conditions. So the, the idea here is to consider you have some boundary conditions on your non-closed strings, but you, you can suppose the non-closed strings, if they happen to touch the boundary condition again, they're, they're always transversal. So this is now not universal because I'm changing the space of strings to consider only those that satisfy this transversality condition. And I'm going to do these, uh, these kind of string topology operations, but in these new space of strings. So you take, you take all the strings, you just cut out the sort of infinite but finite co-dimension submanifolds of the free loop space that you don't like. You just cut them out. And you work in the complement. Who's going to stop me? The mathematicians. So this is, so we change so the algebraic topology changes and you, you can estimate in terms of co-dimension where it first changes and stuff like that but the algebraic topology changes but you can still do operations in fact I'm hoping that when you do these operations on suitably restricted geometric geometrically restricted strings you're going to get finer and finer invariants of 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 the manifolds I mean the dream is to get these four manifold invariants so, and then, uh, so in, in Basu thesis. Would you say again what this uh, mini point is? Yeah, I'm, if this is the boundary condition, then the close, the non-closed strings so have to, that I consider, picture, huh? Is this a picture of the string in the... This is the string here. Yeah, this is the boundary condition. Isn't the boundary condition? And this... Of the closed string, of the non-closed string, open string. Yeah, but the boundary condition is in the moduli space, but the string is. In what? The boundary condition is considered in the moduli space. No, no. It's a No, no. Uh, it's a submanifold. No, no. Uh, so I'm imagining now I have some string interactions. Strings are moving around in some ambient manifold. The ambient manifold has submanifolds. Sub Just any manifold. Yeah, I'm talking about the string topology of that manifold, say. This given submanifold. What? No, we have a given submanifold somewhere. Right, and then I mentioned briefly, I didn't say it very much, that uh, non-closed strings could be thought of as okay. having boundary conditions on sub-manifolds of the given manifold. Like you could have knots in the three-sphere and have strings on that, right? Uh, and so the, uh, the idea is to impose these conditions. Now I wanted to go back to this 3D stuff that you know, basically, three manifolds up to diffeomorphism, they're determined by their homotopy type. It's not quite true, though. There are these lens spaces. Except for that and forming connected sums and so on, it's true. Three manifolds diff are determined, their diffeomorphism type is determined by their homotopy type. But there's this piece of the story which is not homotopy invariant. So, uh, and these have played an interesting role in topology. For example, uh, L71 and L72 have the same homotopy type. By the way, if you don't know this, it's a nice uh, exercise. If you do LPQ, 
and L P prime Q prime. Well, of course, the fundamental group tells you that what P is, and then the Q is uh, the the cohomology ring or the linking structure is determined determines Q a little bit up to a quadratic if if uh, Q and Q prime differ by uh, multiplication by a, something that has a square root, then they have the same cohomology ring. Okay, so the homotopy type determines P and the Q up to a quadratic residue. And uh, so these two things you can check. Let's see, what's... Uh, uh, nine, three squared is nine. So this has a square root, and one has a square root. So these, these are homotopy equivalent, but they're not homeomorphic. So these are homotopy equivalent closed manifolds. They're not homeomorphic. And uh, so what in uh, Somnath's thesis, and by the way, this was one of the problems that was stated in when we made our proposal to the NSF to get this FRG. This is the partly, the half of this conference is like the last FRG conference, and the other half is a generalization, I guess. Uh, that was one of the problems we wanted to know, is the string topology uh, t entirely a homotopy invariant? So this modified version, which is getting rid of this anomaly, is not. And uh, so what Somnath does is, uh, so you you take the direct you take the uh, space of all these transversal strings. So you know you can have several intersections, and these are disconnected because you can't move you can't remove a transversal intersection, keeping it transversal. What? Somebody say that. What's, what's the boundary condition? What? What's what the boundary condition? condition? It doesn't matter. I mean, I'll say in a minute, but I'm just saying this is a general discussion for, for a moment. It's a general discussion. So he defines on this, uh, so you want to get this co-algebra structure. Remember, D is a co-associative. Uh, so you're going to take the chains on this space, and it, it, it has this co-algebra so that, so it has a, a, a co-algebra denoted by delta, if you take a chain on this space, it's the sum, uh, over the alternating sum of the splittings. So you just, you know, you take a, a thing and you, like you split it here, and, and that's the sum of two transversal strings, and then you put it back, and then you split it here, and then you alternate the signs. So you get that. And then you make a differential, which is the internal differential, is the internal differential on the chain plus, this is the interesting part, it's the sum of alternating of the resolve. And the picture of the resolve is, so he's going to do this in co-dimension uh, three. So, I'm going to, so to make a picture in co-dimension three, you have to imagine a point. Uh, you know, so you might have, you might have a zero manifold in R3 and you could have a, a string going through like this. So that would be transversal. I mean, and uh, uh, and what you do is you resolve by you take all ways of avoiding the point. So you get on the chain. If you had a chain, you would increase its dimension by one by putting in this circle of ways of pushing off, right? Um, so I guess there's a shift here to make that work out, and then uh, plus this. And so you get a differential co-algebra, and then you, so you form a, a differential co-algebra out of the open strings. Then this is step one, and then step two, well, you have to take a, a fiber construction, which I'm not going to mention anymore. Then you, then you take the co-bar construction, on this, <clears throat> and then it turns out you you kind of find the this is on algebra, and this is after you've done the fiber thing. You actually find essentially the Pontryagin ring of the base loop space of the complement. 
although it's twisted, so there's a twisting, you define a new, a new multiplication on the Pontryagin ring where alpha is this element in H1 of the base loop space that's described right there of the complement. And then you use rational homotopy theory ideas on this to find massy products structures in the, uh, the two-point configuration space of a certain cover of, I'll just write it without writing the cover, of L71 and L72. So it turns out this one has non-trivial massy products with rational coefficients. This one doesn't. And you can see that from this structure. And so you've distinguished the homeomorphism type because you found this. And uh, of course, this is based on uh, the work of Salvatore and Longoni that showed these two spaces have different massy product structures. So he was heading for that. So they have different rational homotopy types. So anyway, so that shows that from this, when you take this uh, D and you get rid of the anomaly somehow and, and, make, and convert it to algebraic topology, you have a sufficiently fine invariant to distinguish uh, homotopy equivalent but non-diffeomorphic three manifolds. And it's subtle because essentially three manifolds are determined by their homotopy type. And then, uh, And, uh, okay, so then one last, this. so then, uh, so th now this is a co-dimension three example, so there's an interesting co-dimension two example, and we tr do this fast because I want to state the last two problems. Well, I guess I can state, no, let me, let me do this. So this is uh, a joint work with uh, M. Sullivan and, uh, he uses both his ideas and his ideas. So it's co-dimension two. Now co-dimension two, there's this interesting thing. Now I can draw the point, like a point in the plane. So I've got this string coming along. I realize this point that uh, if you look at all the spheres, uh, the top homology of the sphere you think is Z. But it's not true in dimension zero. The top homology of the zero sphere is Z plus Z. And this is coming in right here. So in co-dimension two, actually when you resolve, there's actually a two-dimensional space of ways of resolving. And in this theory, I want to use this one. So you actually take the plus sign, which is very interesting. I fought this for years working with Michael because a topologist wants to take the minus sign because when you move this across here, it's sort of, it's this minus this is equal to the deformation, but anyways. But, and this is some kind of different boundary operator you can make. It's, I think it's very somehow very quantum. It's not part of algebraic topology. It's a uh, co-dimension two. So anyway, you, you also, uh, so again, you, 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 make, you make the same co-algebra construction as Somnat does here, and you take the, uh, uh, the cobar, so you take the same differential algebra as Somnas, but with this notion of resolution, so you get a, a differential graded co-algebra, and then you take the cobar, and then, uh, which is, now you get an algebra. It doesn't have a unit because of this twisting. Um, and you get the twisted group ring of the complement of, of, oh no, now I'm going to apply this to knots, sorry. I didn't say what I was applying it to. Applying it to knots in S3. And um, then, uh, th and th I'm quickly describing two papers. This is paper one. Then we take the, uh, we add a unit, and then we put the meridian in the center. You, you add a relation. Anyway, so it's just an algebraic construction out of this differential co-algebra, which is D. And then this is isomorphic to what's called the Lenny-Eng chord algebra. 
this has a certain story. But anyway, this is something produced by Lenny Ng. Uh, he just took the knot complement and took the group ring and the fun fundamental group and then did some constructions with it. And so we're getting this chord algebra out of uh, sort of a functorial operation in the, in the string theory. And he computed with this thing and he could distinguish all knots up to 11 crossings with this chord algebra. And on the other hand, this chord algebra is isomorphic to the degree zero uh, Legendrian knot homology, which is constructed by looking at the cotangent bundle of the sphere and the co-normal Lagrangian submanifold and making and then restricting to the contact manifold the sphere bundle and Legendrian piece of the Lagrangian and then making holomorphic curve constructions and so on and so on. And, uh, and it turns out the degree zero part of that is isomorphic to this N-chord algebra, which is also constructed from the string topology. So it, it's a powerful knot invariant. And then just very quickly, I'll say the, the other one is we use the Costello idea. Remember, the Costello idea was that somehow the open strings determine the Lie algebra and closed strings. And so if you apply that to, uh, again, to this type of uh, algebra, it's actually, well, anyway, use the Costello idea, you apply a sort of a cyclic bar construction to um, uh, actually the, we, we use this algebra structure and resolve, and then one actually finds the uh, uh, the Lie algebra of the complement, and then by uh, the Chas Siddhartha argument, one can read off the uh, form of the geometric decomposition of the complement. So you can read off whether a knot has a hyperbolic volume or not, or in other words, it has a geometric decomposition. So you, one can read that off by applying the Hochschel to this combined structure. Now we use these two things together. Okay, so that leads me to problem three then. Uh, it's gone. Oh yeah, so describe the, you know, the algebraic structure of this transversal open string theory. See, because you can get rid of this anomaly and you know you you have a different the rules are the rules are different. So this is not universal string topology because you're restricting the spaces of strings. And then problem four Well, yeah, now, um, so when it, you state a problem like this, it's actually, the problem is to formulate the problem. So for example, you know, like what Jacob Lurie did with this uh, category theory, he figured out the structure of these fully dualizable objects and, and so the cobordism category. You want to just, I mean, suppose you could figure out that statement before you even proved it. I mean, already that would be a nice thing to do. So that, the analog of that, the problem is to sort of describe what these structures are or what they might be as, as a conjecture. And problem four is like that too. It turns out <coughs> uh, there are many instances, this thing I just mentioned that uh, uh, the Eng chord algebra, what happened to it? The Eng chord algebra, which is something you get out of uh, looking at the cotangent bundle to S3 and the co-normal Lagrangian submanifold and then looking at boundary value problems of J-homorphic curves. So it seems that uh, there's a very general situation here where uh, if you take all of the possible constructions, it seems like this, this uh, string theory is, this, this kind of string theory is is sort of some kind of real analog of 
of J holomorphic curves. And, 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 and when you study not just closed symplectic manifolds, but, but open uh, symplectic manifolds with contact boundary, and look, at the, and look at the structure near the boundary, and look at the J holomorphic curves there, then that has a lot of structure, and the compactification is almost the same as the one I was referring to here. There's another little feature, because in that case there's a, 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 a harmonic function which is super, har there's a function which is super harmonic that has to be preserved. So you can still have minimum, but no maximum. So you, the compactification, so there's some little balls you have to get rid of those little disks because they give you these uh, curvature terms or weak, like e weak algebra structures. So you have to sort of, and you use, the simple, you use the symplectic filling of the contact manifold to get rid of those. And then there's sort of a conjecture that after you do that, the structure you get should be equivalent to this structure. But, you know, I don't know the analog of this transversal. Uh, open closed string theory in the symplectic story. It should be there because you use it to get this thing in that case. So the problem four is to formulate, even to formulate. Don't worry about defining all of string topology and all of symplectic contact J holomorphic curve geometry, but formulate conjectures relating the uh, Naive, I call it the naive real analog, right? There's string, string interactions, this string interactions sort of naively interpreted in terms of algebraic topology and the, uh, uh, the J holomorphic curves. I haven't said in this talk what this means, but it doesn't matter. A complex curve, uh, uh, and I, but I was thinking of so checking some point. I was when I was thinking about this lecture. Uh, in this, it helps. It's not really necessary, but it really helps me when I know the manifolds orientable. And uh, but Poincaré duality is really the main thing. Naive Poincaré duality, and in this uh, J holomorphic curve story, it makes sense anytime you have starts making sense anytime you have a manifold that has an almost complex structure, a J operator, then you can consider maps of a surface in that commute with J. Those are called J holomorphic curves. But in fact, you don't really have a theory until you suppose the manifold is symplectic. So I'm wondering, is symplectic the, playing the role of Poincaré duality in that context? That's the question I'm asking. Uh, anyway, so somehow this is, this, this is, this, all this stuff is all about Poincaré duality because you're intersecting things at various levels. And uh, anyway, so formulate conjectures relating the, the algebraic structures that arise here and the ones that arise here. So uh, Lashef and Seelbach, I don't know how this. Uh, Janko and Kai, uh, f they have formulated the conjecture fairly precisely for this Lie by algebra, the one that appeared here. This Lie by algebra can be formulated in symplectic topology and, uh, and they've conjectured they're equal. So the, the idea is that you have all this stuff you can do for symplectic and contact manifolds, but if we have an ordinary manifold, it has its cotangent bundle and a cotangent sphere bundle, which is a contact manifold, symplectic manifold pair. And so you can restrict the symplectic structure discussion to that, and then those structures, presumably, which are defined by PDEs, are equivalent to the structures you, that you can define by this naive algebraic topology. So those are the four problems, and that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Too much material at the end. I know that we are young people. Don't give talks like this where you put a lot of material at the end because then the audience is already saturated. They don't have any questions. Oh, there's a question? Oh, well. <laughs> chain level version of 
string topology operation. Yeah. What, what's the status of that? You did it. It'll tell you tomorrow. It's quick. Somebody repeat the question. Okay. Something about chain level version? Chain level string topology. Yeah, what's, that's not can a sentence yet. It? Huh? Can you construct it? Can I construct it? Does it exist? Or can anyone construct it? Can anyone construct it? Well, he said it in the last uh, talk. Well, there are many answers to this. Um, uh, what uh, Daniel explained in the last talk was uh, he got the chains on the open moduli space to act on the on the chains of the free loop space of the manifold, because kind of what? That's a formal construction. Yeah. You mentioned description of that. That's, that's the so the, the answer is yes, though, right? And then, um, uh, depending on what you're doing, uh, uh, Scott Wilson's thesis was if you have any algebraic operation defined over an operad essentially which any algebraic structure controlled by an operad and if you you had it defined at the chain level on an appropriately full set of chains for example the ones that are transversal then the infinity well this is a I'm modifying his statement to what I want then the infinity version of that algebraic structure acts on those on the completely on the chains so that's, that's a statement. But that's not good enough for the kind of discussion we're having because uh, this, uh, this combined structure here, which involves algebra and co-algebra, is not an algebra over an operat. So it's, it's got co-multiplications co and multiplications mixed together. So you want another statement like that. Uh, I once asked Jacob Lurie I converted it into his language, and I got an answer from him. But it was, I'm not smart enough to understand it. So, but I think there was an answer. But I think, you know, this shouldn't be easy to get something that's perfectly satisfactory from the point of view of geometry and analysis. Let me, let me, there's a problem of five that I didn't state, but since you, and, I, and I'm not over time now, because I'm answering a question, right? <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, See, this is related to this FRG. I mean, we had a, we had a, we kind of met informally in Poland four or five years ago. Remember that conference? And we had a nice interaction, you, you, you with, you and Peter with Mahmoud, for example. Now, what I was imagining might happen, and I think it possibly could have happened, but it, and it's not happening for me, but maybe some of Kevin or his students are, know about it. Is, see, if you look at the history of algebraic topology and you reverse it a little bit, you can say it's like this. We didn't know about differential forms and integrals and things like that. But somehow we got the idea of triangulating spaces and looking at the boundary and taking homology. And then we took the dual space and got cohomology and we did obstruction theory. We did Steenrod squares. We started making chain homotopies. We made a cup product. We got infinity algebras and everything. We got all that because Steenrod actually had the idea of infinity algebras. He had his hierarchy of hom homotopies, which is just the idea of infinity algebra. And then suddenly somebody came along and said, gee, if you make these uh, co-chains, make these simplices really tiny, there's this Grossmann algebra. And there are things which are called differential forms in exterior D. And there's this beautiful graded commutative differential algebra which models this algebraic topology. Because that's in fact the way I learned it. I learned the algebraic topology before I learned differential forms. I remember going to Quillen one day and said, why do differential forms exist? You know? I mean, you guys have had a different exposure. And he sort of thought from it and said, well, I think it's the Grossmann algebra. Anyway, there's some non-trivial construction there. So I was imagining that all of this algebraic topology in the loop space, which is kind of coarse, but it has interesting structure, like Lie by algebras and stuff, that there would be some Durham theory that would be defined by some kind of limiting procedure and some beautiful algebraic structure. And then, hopefully, it would have fit more with your precise dreams of defining 
topological quantum field theories and stuff like that, which are actually, that don't have all this fluff in it. And then, uh, that's also related to your question of making it geometric, making the multiplication geometric and the operation geometric. But that still hasn't been done. But you can imagine it. That's problem five. Well, Kate said she has. No, I, I put words in Kate's mouth. Well, <laughs> Kate's going to talk tomorrow, right? Um, so we'll see what they have. Yeah. OK. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, just a comment about this circle uh, and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Gabriel has a nice paper he wrote last year. Right. Proving this. I was reading it last night. I think it's the right. first proof anybody has written down. What? I think it's the first time anybody actually wrote, wrote an actual proof. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, for genus one. zero. Right. Oh, that, um, that if you trivialize the circle action, then you can extend it between more for compactification. Right. No, that's that. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to. I I had an. When I was thinking about what I was going to talk about, I couldn't remember a lot of this stuff. And so I sent out some emails to a bunch of people. And I got back some wonderful responses, re references and so on. So I'm going to make all that available on, with these papers. And then you can just download it. And Gabriel's paper's there. And you know some of your papers, some of Jacob's papers, and Telemann's papers. And, uh, uh, it makes a, and, the, and the emails make a sort of guide through these papers. So you can read the emails and then start reading the papers. And it, I have been doing that through the last 48 hours, and I just totally filled my head with information, and then decided I couldn't talk about it, except write your names down. So that's what I did. Anyway. <laughs> All right. Okay. Right. Thank you.